first speaker uh, of this session is Eric Winfrey. It's a pleasure and an honor to uh, talk after um, Pierre uh, Luigi Luisi. Um, there's going to be uh, a certain amount of overlap uh, with some of the motivations for uh, his talk, uh, in particular the question, uh, why this and uh, why that and why not? Um, but there'll be a very different perspective uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of systems that I'll be looking at. So I'm going to talk about exploring uh, evolution with DNA tile-based crystals, and there'll be some uh, connection to uh, the origin of life and some connection to the question of what kinds of systems can we actually build uh, experimentally. And I should mention that this work um, is primarily by Rebecca Schulman, a graduate student in my lab, uh, was a graduate student, now uh, a postdoc at uh, Berkeley. Um, so as Pierre mentioned, uh, I'm not sure where that beeping's coming from. Um, Self-replication is a very complicated process in modern organisms. And uh, it seems to be just sort of intrinsically complex. And if we ask how simple can self-replication be, um, we might come down to something like uh, uh, 50 proteins. And that's already more than you would expect, to, more complexity than you expect to uh, occur spontaneously uh, by some natural process. Uh, so are there, are there processes that can support self-replication, or more importantly, uh, can support Darwinian evolution, uh, which we can see is the, uh, the key property we need to initiate some kind of um, life-like process. Uh, if you can start evolution um, in so any kind of material, perhaps it will have the, complex the potential to become more complex uh, and lead towards uh, modern life forms. So there was a proposal um, for a simple chemical system that can undergo Darwinian evolution, um, uh, back in the 60s, uh, that was quite radical, um, and uh, we can ask whether it has any merit, um, and the question here is really, how do we ask whether it has any merit? So um, Graham Cairn Smith uh, made the argument that the very simplest form of Darwinian evolution conceivable is that of uh, crystal growth, basically mineral growth. Uh, and this Hypothesis is based on a few observations. First, to have Darwinian evolution, you need some kind of storage of information in a material. Uh, and he was aware of a variety of crystals, uh, such as uh, layered micas and, and actually quite a few different kinds of uh, materials, uh, where uh, the crystal uh, isn't a uniform structure but can have different layers. You can think of them as black and white layers. So if a cross-section of this crystal looks maybe something like this with, with thick layers and thin layers, uh, different kinds of structures, if the same minerals can support arbitrary sequences, then you could think of this crystal as having a particular genotype, the sequence in the, the cross-section of that mineral. Now, if furthermore crystal growth allows the growth of a small crystal to a large piece and extends that patterning of the layer structure as it grows, you have some simple replication of information. Uh, and it's clearly replication if you imagine the crystal being broken up into bits by some kind of physical process, such that each of the individual uh, fragments has the same information. So these are the, uh, uh, some of the uh, preconditions you need for Darwinian evolution. Information storage, replication, uh, and multiplication. Now, the other thing that you need is some kind of selective pressure. Um, and to make this at all reasonable, you know, as a sort of story for uh, our origin of life, you need some pathway whereby the information stored in these uh, um, crystals has some kind of selective advantage. For example, by catalyzing particular chemical reactions on the surface that might depend upon the sequence, um, or perhaps just changing the morphology uh, of the crystal. Um, there are other kinds of questions, like how would you get from, even if you could have Darwinian evolution in a system like this, how would you get from uh, crystals to organic mo um, modern life? Um, and Kieran Smith sort of hypothesized that um, for that to happen, there would have to be some kind of genetic takeover where information is stored in different media uh, over a sort of series of different kinds of evolutionary processes. So uh, you can sort of th think of... Uh, 
your old music files that were originally on LPs and then on uh, uh, audio tapes and then on CDs and, and now on your iPod uh, as the same information going through different, different media. So could this have happened um, in the natural system? Um, so it's very difficult to experimentally explore these kinds of questions because these kinds of crystals are, are difficult to um, uh, grow and work with in the laboratory. And uh, furthermore, there's sort of a limited set of, of crystals that, that uh, are available. So the task that um, Rebecca and I embarked upon was trying to uh, develop some kind of model system that, uh, if you look at the molecular details, has no prebiotic relevance but which um, allows us to explore the basic concept of evolution by crystal. Is this, is this conceptually feasible at all? Uh, and so there'll be two interesting things, I hope, uh, in my talk. One will be um, uh, the potential relevance of, of the systems that we've been designing to this question about uh, the origin of life and evaluation of uh, Karen Smith's hypothesis, uh, getting some kind of experimental insight in, into um, into it, its merits and demerits. Um, and the other side is simpl simply an examination of, uh, or a set of examples of what we can design molecularly. Um, could we design a uh, evolving uh, crystal system uh, regardless of its relevance to towards the uh, uh, origin of life on Earth, independent of that? Um, okay, so a life cycle of a modern organism involves uh, a few things, uh, the replication of information, uh, the division of a cell, um, the multiplication uh, uh, into, uh, you know, having offspring. Uh, and in order to do this, of course, it needs some kind of nutrients with which to grow. What are the sort of analogous things for a crystal? Uh, so here's our sort of mock-up of the kinds of system we'd like to make. We'd like to have crystals uh, in solution. Each one of these little colorful strips is meant to be a crystal with uh, a different sequence cross-section. And the idea is if you put in the appropriate kind of uh, monomers that allow these crystals to grow, uh, small crystals like these will become longer crystals. If you uh, subject them some kind of physical stress, they'll fragment into pieces uh, where each piece uh, has the same information as its uh, parent crystal. Um, and there might be some death due to flushing out, out the end. Um, uh, there's another uh, pathway uh, illustrated here that's, that's fairly important, uh, which is the spontaneous growth of crystals. So, so if you have, you know, minerals, um, uh, and uh, a crystal can just naturally grow, right? You don't need a, a remarkable event to get a crystal to grow. Um, so you, you have some kind of nucleation pathway that generates new organisms with new sequences. Um, so this kind of system has the potential to avoid the miracle that seems to be required to, to, to uh, spontaneously generate um, organic-based self-replicating systems. So we're going to sort of try to design a system like this uh, from scratch, de novo, um, using components that we know how to engineer. And to do that, we borrow from what's known as DNA tech, uh, nanotechnology, uh, which was uh, developed by Ned Seaman uh, and, uh, and uh, others. Um, the piece that we'll be using here is known as a double crossover molecule. Uh, it consists of four strands of DNA that have been designed specifically to form this uh, sort of unusual uh, structure. So if you follow, for example, this strand, it folds over on itself at what's known as a, uh, a crossover point. Uh, another strand here uh, folds over at a second crossover point uh, and holds together the yellow strand and the uh, purple strand. Uh, so there's a fourth strand there and uh, the intermediate third strand. Now, these can be designed by designing the sequences of the interior region so that these molecules fold quite well, and, and you can do it with a variety of sequences as long as the sequences that specify which parts of which molecules stick to each other, as long as those sequences are unique, uh, we can make these structures quite reliably. Furthermore, we can design onto them binding sites that indicate how these pieces, sort of as, as monomers in a self-assembly reaction, stick to other monomers. So we have five base sticky ends on the edges where we can 
uh, design a particular sequence on each one of these four sides that determine how it sticks to other pieces. So to design a crystal, you design several of these monomers. Uh, so here uh, we see uh, a design with six. And although it's not shown, each one of these sticky ends is going to have a particular sequence. So here I'm showing the sequence on that sticky end, the sequence on this sticky end, and the sequence on this sticky end. And what's illustrated is that if you have two molecules with complementary sticky ends, they can stick together by Watson-Crick base pairing. Um, but other sticky ends will have different sequences and won't stick. So for this particular set of molecules, uh, they were designed to form a ribbon structure that could be extended in this direction and this direction uh, that has the brown molecule appearing on the top, the gray on the bottom, and the purple and green molecules uh, on the inside. And although I haven't written the specific sequences, you should imagine that, that uh, at each location, for example, here for the pur purple and green, there's a specific sequence that mediates their binding and a different sequence that mediates the binding for other molecules. So we can program these systems to make specific crystal morphologies. Um, just to avoid the detailed structure here, I'll, I'll often just draw these as, as sort of bricks with uh, colored sides uh, indicating uh, which parts can bind to which, which other parts. So for example, this molecule can bind here by attaching it to sites. Um, and important for this talk will be that uh, a molecule that binds only one site but not the other uh, will tend not to uh, stick because the other molecule will uh, be preferred, essentially. Although it could stick by one site, it will fall off very frequently under the growth conditions that we'll use. So that one won't bind. Um, so under these kinds of growth conditions, these ribbons grow, uh, uh, at least are presumed to grow, in a zigzag fashion where a tile that binds then produces another site where a tile can bind by two sticky ends which produces another site where a tile can bind by two sticky ends, which uh, these double tiles at, at the end the, that are sort of the size of, of two monomers uh, allow the growth direction to reverse. And this process can then grow, and it sort of zig zigzags back and forth uh, for favorable growth of the crystal, and it, of course it can grow on both, both sides. So these molecules can be designed and uh, created basically by cooling a mixture of the, of the DNA uh, in solution to create crystals. So here you see a five micron atomic force microscope image of several of these crystals that were so grown. And looking at them much closer, you can see individual tiles. And you can see that, in fact, they are four tiles uh, wide. So we really can make these, these crystals. Um, furthermore, these, the system is programmable. We can design different tile sets to investigate different kinds of crystals that have different properties that we might be interested in. For example, here we designed a set of four tiles make a three-wide crystal and it forms three-wide crystals. Here's the uh, uh, four-wide crystal that I showed you with six tiles. Uh, here's a, another set of molecules that makes five-wide crystals. Here's one that makes six-wide crystals. So it's, it's straightforward. Uh, it's, it's a programmable system for making different crystal morphologies. Now, to explore the possibility of evolution, we need to store information in these crystals. So how do we design that? Well, here's an example. Suppose we have, in addition to uh, the tiles that I showed you before, these six, suppose we also have some yellow and blue ones. These ones have the same sticky ends on their sort of uh, upper left and lower right as do uh, these tiles so that they can fit in the same place. But in the other direction, they have a different set of, of sticky ends. Here it's red instead of gray. Or, uh, uh, sorry, red, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, light gray instead of brown. Um, so this row can either be purple or blue-yellow. So that's one bit of information. There, there are two types of crystals. Similarly, you could have a different monomer that uh, appears here, you know, perhaps uh, black and white monomers. Uh, they could store a separate bit. So this would be a crystal that stores two bits and copies it from layer to layer. Um, so we also made this in the laboratory. Um, and what you can see here, uh, if, if uh, the tile that represents, well, one of the tiles is marked with uh, a group, basically a hairpin of DNA that makes it larger, so we can see it by atomic force microscopy. Um, you can see that row uh, of ones is copied, and occasionally it, it, it makes a mistake. So this, this row of ones turned into a zero. Uh, so there's some kind of error rate. So we can make crystals that copy information, but they have errors. 
And we know that errors aren't very good for evolution. If you have too many errors, uh, your genome quickly melts, um, and you don't have uh, evolution occurring. So we use a technique known as uh, proofreading to, uh, to decrease the error rates in crystals. So we can design new crystals that have lower error rates. Um, how is this done? So here is our, uh, an example of an original crystal where each row uh, can either be green or yellow. Um, here is a, uh, and, and these rows are independent. Here is a crystal that has proofreading where you have pairs of rows that can either be both uh, uh, green or both yellow because they have a sticky end that, that's only compatible. For example, this one matches only yellow on this side and is incompatible with, with a, a green tile on that side. So you have to flip both of these uh, monomers in order to flip the, the information that's being propagated. And uh, that uh, increasingly destabilizes an error and therefore decreases the error rate. So these uh, here were a series of four uh, crystals that were built, and we were able to measure the error rates decreasing exponentially with the amount of proofreading that was being used. So we can actually decrease errors uh, quite considerably. Um, another issue that comes up is spontaneous nucleation. So if you have uh, an existing fragment, it can grow. If you have a piece that's uh, not uh, yet um, uh, full width, um, nothing happens except every now and again pieces will bump into each other and just happen to spontaneously get wide enough that they can start to uh, uh, grow. Uh, if that happens, then you have spontaneous nucleation of a particular pattern that was sort of random due to the process that occurred, uh, random sequence events during nucleation of this crystal, uh, unlike growth from a seed where you, you copy a specific pattern of information. Um, so the other important factor we have here, which I'll, I'll skip the details of how we measured it, um, has to do with uh, the nucleation rate and showing that wider crystals when we design these crystals wider, they have lower nucleation rates so that we can make a, uh, a crystal wide enough, we can decrease the, low, the error rate to uh, almost a negligible value. So now we want to use this, this ability to prevent spontaneous generation so that the only kind of growth occurs uh, from some pre-existing fragment. Uh, now that pre-existing fragment could be a fragment of a, of a crystal that had previously grown and was part of an evolutionary cycle. Um, or, for experimental purposes, we actually design a seed for this kind of growth that's based on DNA origami, uh, which I won't get into, but um, this, the, this is a, a DNA structure about 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers that we can design and, and synthesize, and we can put specific sequences on the edges that, uh, from which tiles can grow. So this can serve as a seed for growing um, a crystal, and we can design a particular pattern uh, from which it can grow. Um, and I'll briefly show you uh, three tile sets that we use to, to sort of illustrate uh, this kind of uh, information uh, bearing seed and informational growth process. The first is a tile set that can generate crystals of various widths and will program the seeds with uh, essentially different widths of, of starting sequences. Uh, second, we'll create a crystal, uh, a seed that has different patterns of zeros and ones and we'll create a set of tiles, in this case, these tiles all together that copy information from row to row. That's very similar to what we've already seen. And third, we'll add some extra uh, tiles that do some kind of information processing as they grow. Um, so I'd like to show you that that works. So here, here's the set of tiles that has, uh, uh, we have a variable width component. This is the, the four wide. If we add uh, two more tiles into our design, we can create something like this, but the sticky ends over here and the sticky ends over here are exactly the same, which means that it's also compatible to have, uh, oh, basically to insert an arbitrary number of, of layers of, of, uh, of those tiles to create uh, ribbons of different widths. So you have this repeatable block. So if you assemble those tiles without a seed, uh, the thinnest ribbon is what nucleates. Uh, so if you take a look at this histogram of widths, what we see are a lot of the thinnest widths. Now, if we uh, grow these crystals in the presence of seeds, this, we now have growth coming specifically from the seeds, and we can specify the width. So the width is being copied from the seed to the crystal and continuing to grow. So it's the same set of uh, molecules in solution, in all cases, just a different seed. 
So here you can see that we specified width 8 in the seed. Here we added a seed that had width 10 in it. And here we added a seed that had width 12. So this is information uh, uh, from the seed being propagated reliably by crystal growth. Um, so now let's go to uh, adding four more tiles that allow us to copy a different pattern. Uh, and so now we can take seeds that have different patterns on it. This pattern had, had the 100 pattern on it. Uh, this seed had a 1001 pattern. And this seed had a 01011 pattern. Um, and you can see that we have fairly low error rates now. We can actually, uh, by taking a lot of images, uh, measure that error rate. So crystals can grow and copy information. Um, but they can also do something more interesting. And this was sort of part of the surprise of, of, of this experimental investigation of crystals. They did something that wasn't really foreseen uh, by Kieran Smith, which is to create uh, complex patterns. So here, by adding a few more crystal types that we designed intentionally, uh, we actually designed crystals that, that propagate, that, do, that modify the information from layer to layer. In this case, they actually count in binary. This was just a sort of example of pattern formation. So here's uh, a crystal that grew um, from the seed. And if you look at, at these diagonal rows, sort of a, a, as outlined in yellow here, you'll see that each row has a different pattern. So this is an interpretation of this crystal up here. This is the number one. This is the number two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and then an error was made here, and the crystal counted to nine. Um, the logic of, of some simple operation like counting can be actually embedded in just the way these tiles fit together. Um, and we happen to design the system, but other unusual sets of, of um, other tiles will generate different kinds of algorithmic patterns. Uh, for example, another design pattern here generates this sort of uh, uh, fractal uh, triangular, triangles within triangles pattern, no, known as a Sierpinski pattern. Um, so what relevance does that have on evolution? So this is the last point in, in my talk. Um, this, this idea of algorithmic patterns gives us a, a new insight into uh, evolutionary processes that might generate complexity that wasn't there previously. Um, basically, how, do you, how can evolution have a simple selective bias that leads to more complex genomes? Uh, and this is the simplest kind of uh, uh, selection pressure that we can imagine for crystals. So suppose you have a, uh, a crystal that was based on monomers with these kinds of interactions. Uh, so red sticks to red, and you can see the little uh, pokey pieces that indicate how, how the, uh, the, they fit together. So you can fit these pieces together in, uh, uh, in various ways. Here's a three-wide uh, ribbon that... Uh, uh, uses these pieces, and it has a repeating block. Basically, any re ribbon is going to produce a pattern that repeats at some point. Um, but there are other ways of fitting these pieces together. Uh, here are a few of them. Uh, there's two wide, three wide patterns uh, with different repeat lengths and different utilization of the different components. So if you were growing these crystals un uh, in a situation where, let's say, this tile was fairly rare, crystal patterns that used this tile would not be able to grow very quickly. There's not very much of it around. Uh, a pattern that doesn't use this tile could grow faster. And if we actually look at the set of crystals that could grow, this is sort of the, the, the space of possible organisms, the space of possible uh, genotypes. Their phenotypes are, well, how many of these tiles do we have? And it turns out in the system that wider crystals, they're for wider crystals, there exist patterns that use this tile more rarely. So there'd be an evolutionary selection to grow these wider crystals that can grow faster than the shorter crystals that have a higher fraction of, of, the, uh, uh, of the rare tile. So this is just one example of uh, how an algorithmic growth process of crystals can lead to a, a selective pressure. So this is um, uh, a long way from uh, from any plausible uh, recapitulation of, of Karen Smith's theory for Darwinian evolution and uh, genetic takeover, but it provides us with some uh, new insights and uh, um, an experimental platform for, for asking uh, questions. 
And furthermore, it, it gives us an actual demonstration that uh, evolution of crystals is possible, uh, although we haven't gone through the full process, the full cycle of, of fragmenting crystals and, and, and growing them under conditions uh, that have a selective bias, we've demonstrated uh, most, of the, most of the key processes that would be needed to do so, such as low error rate uh, growth, the capacity of a crystal to store information, and the capacity of that information to, to produce some kind of uh, selective uh, pressure. Uh, in closing, I'll just uh, um, uh, use a quote from Graham Cairn Smith. Uh, but would not the term organism be altogether too uh, pretentious uh, for, well, just a mass of tiny crystals? One might be inclined to insist on something more interesting before using the word organism to Cairn uh, Smith says, uh, that would be sheer prejudice. We're never going to find or make primary organisms if we have two high-flown ideas about what they should be like, they'll be all potential with little or no achievement, like a graduate student. Of course, they're going to be boring, poor things. Um, so um, I want to emphasize that uh, the work was done by Rebecca Schulman here. She's showing me uh, uh, how to put our crystals through uh, um, a, a small fluidic pore in order to fragment them. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. You said in a brilliant work in um, supramolecular chemistry and complexity. I, I have some doubt about uh, the, you know, the relevance with origin of life and Darwinian evolution, etc. As metaphors are beautiful when you don't believe too much in them. Uh, for example, you start from DNA already existing. If you have DNA, you have also RNA and probably also proteins and nucleotides. So you have already a scenario where replication of DNA may occur by its own mechanism. You don't need uh, crystals to make uh, replication. So I don't see the relevance of replication in that sense. And also, you know, in terms of uh, evolution, etc. Certainly, if you build complexity, it's going to go the way you beautifully describe. But to call that Darwinian evolution, it's, uh, you know, it's a forcing that, uh, that does need to, I mean, your work is so beautiful per se, that does not need the excuse of this kind uh, to stand, I believe. Yeah, I, I think these are good points, thank you. Um, so, for, first, I, I, I I, I hope I said this uh, in, the, in the talk originally, and I'll re-emphasize re it, that this particular system is not meant as a hypothesis for you know, what could have happened prebiotically. Uh, it's meant as sort of a, uh, a, a toy system for exploring the kinds of mechanisms for crystal growth that, that could exist. So some of the phenomena that we see uh, in this work with these very artificial DNA-based molecules um, are general principles. For example, the um, ability for certain ways, for certain kinds of crystals to decrease their error rates by having proofreading is a phenomenon that goes beyond the particular DNA molecules that we have. Uh, similarly, the, the, the possibility to, for complex pattern formation goes beyond the particular DNA molecules. So, so it's just a test system. It's not at all prebiotically plausible, but it might give us some kinds of insights towards uh, the kinds of phenomena that, that crystals can exhibit that are worth keeping in mind if we're to evaluate Karen Smith's argument. Last quick, quick question. So, uh, I guess uh, I wanted to ask how special DNA is in your mind. Uh, what's your, if you were, you know, if the government passed a law saying you couldn't synthesize DNA anymore, what would you do your experiments with? What would be your second or third choices? Oh, RNA. Uh, nucleic acid. <laughs> All right, nucleic acid. Um, so almost everything we do doesn't depend upon DNA, except insofar as it is very easy to engineer. So the theory that we're working with just depends upon being able to build some kind of monomer that has programmable binding sites that are fairly weak so that we can have non-covalent non supermolecular chemistry with reversible uh, uh, growth. Um, 
I mean, if we could do protein design a little bit better, I think we could design systems with, uh, out of proteins that are of the same complexity. Um, I feel a little bit at a loss, though, as to what I could do tomorrow um, without DNA, just because it is very predictable uh, and well explored in terms of how we can engineer it. Sorry, uh, so we uh, have a uh, coffee break. Yeah. So I, I think all, all the kinds of phenomena that we see here uh, with these DNA molecules could apply to organic molecules that have, you know, fit together and make certain kinds of uh, bonds. However, uh, small organic molecules often have many, many different ways of fitting together, uh, which complicate the landscape and the kinds of interactions that can occur and the predictability. Whereas the DNA molecules uh, really benefit from this Watson-Crick base pairing that, that provides order um, to the molecules as, as they fit together. Um, and it, it simplifies our reasoning about it because we don't have to consider so many alternative ways that the molecules could pack. All right. So um, now let's uh, all speaker uh, again for their excellent talk.